welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I am Heather Indershaw, I'm the Director of Graduate Studies uh, for the MIT Comparative Media Studies Program. And uh, what we are going to do today, I'm going to give you a, a brief presentation. Um, and some of it, hello Vivek, come on in. Some of it, um, and the, the tone of it is going to be a bit like that. Hello, come on in, because we have... I was just imitating what would happen. Uh, we have a number of people stopping by who have, you know, 10 minutes between class, and so we may at certain points interrupt people to just say, oh, welcome, Ian uh, Condry, one of our colleagues, only has a few minutes. Um, but we wanted to get as many faculty as possible and, and lab managers and so on who could come by to uh, sort of uh, show their faces. Um, you can ask them questions later. Some of them might be a colloquium later, and also they'll be introducing themselves. Um, Shannon Larkin over here is our administrative assistant graduate officer. Academic administrator. Academic administrator. Um, and uh, she knows all. So she's a good person for you to follow up with about, you know, very specific questions like, wait, where do I put my GRE scores or, you know, this kind of stuff. Um, and deadlines and that kind of thing. And it's all on our website too. Um, but there's so much on our website that it can be a lot to navigate. Uh, so she can help you with that as well. So I'll give a brief introduction, and then we'll, um, we already have one of our professors, Vivek Ball. Do you want to sit up here? This is sort of the official spot. Uh, and Anika is one of our grad students, and Mika is one of our research scientists. Um, so uh, this is our beautiful building, which is just a few blocks away, looking very sort of Ridley Scott movie-ish there. Um, and uh, at CMS, we, uh, as you can see, address the challenges brought about by ongoing and fundamental changes in the technologies and practices of media production, distribution, and consumption. And we're not looking, uh, there are a lot of programs out there that are, you know, TV studies, film studies, uh, less than popular music, but things that are kind of siloed by media. And we try to do something that's uh, more dynamic, genuinely comparative, historical, and uh, multi multidisciplinary. Um, one thing that is confusing for some people who come to the CMSW website is, depending on why they came to the website, what's CMS or what's W? <laughs> so uh, in a nutshell, comparative media studies merged with writing and humanist humanistic studies, um, I believe it's in 2012. And um, there are separate undergraduate programs where you can be a major in comparative media studies or a major in writing. Um, a lot of those folks, you can imagine, most people who come to MIT are not coming we have a fabulous humanities go, uh, program going on here, but they come in more often for engineering or they want to build robots, world domination, you know, that, that kind of thing. <laughs> um, and then they realize how fabulous our humanities are, that we uh, require eight humanities classes for the undergrads, and they, you know, which is more than a lot of technologically oriented schools. Um, and they end up double majoring in, uh, you know, writing and rocket science. Um, so we have these two undergraduate programs and we also have two graduate programs. We have the Comparative Media Studies program and the um, graduate program in uh, uh, science writing which was established in uh, 1999. So uh, we are part of the School of Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences. Um, if you've been following the uh, minor, if you've been following the news, uh, you might have noticed that we were recently ranked uh, one of the three best universities for arts and humanities education, along with Harvard and Stanford. Um, and then this was by uh, Times Higher Education, which is a leading British uh, education magazine. And then we were ranked number one in the social sciences by that same publication a, a few weeks later. So um, that's the propaganda. We're great. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, we have graduated 90 students or so in comparative media studies. They work in a range of areas. Um, there are about 30% of them go on to pursue doctoral degrees. This is Lacey Lord, another one of our grad students. Hello. Who I will uh, have her introduce herself in a few minutes. Um, and so about 30% of our class, and it seems to happen every year, if we take in 10 students, about three of them end up going in, uh, pursuing a PhD or some kind of next step in, a, in terms of degree. Uh, uh, and about 70% go into various kinds of professional endeavors, game design, TV production, um, management, uh, museum education, not-for-profit work, advertising, marketing. Um, there's a strong civic orientation among a lot of students. So some people go a kind of more corporate route. Some people go a more not-for-profit route and uh, are getting into um, activism and social justice issues. So it's really a wide range. 
Um, we get about 100 applications each year, and we admit about 8 to 10 of that. Um, it's very competitive. Uh, Often we want to admit 15, but we just can't pull it off. Um, part of the reason we can't pull off that large class is that we really um, want to fully fund everyone who comes in by hook or by crook. So some people come in with outside funding from, say, uh, the Chinese government, or you know, there are various ways that people come from abroad and may have uh, funding from home. Uh, but generally, most of the funding we do through um, research lab sponsorships, that if you come in, you would be assigned to a research lab um, working about, would you say, 20 hours a week? Is that kind of standard? Um, and that uh, pays your monthly stipend, which is how much currently, Shannon? Uh, just over 2500 a month. Just over 2500 a month. That's <coughs> a kind of crass question that we all have on our minds that I'm just going to tell you right now. It's good to know. Um, and it covers your tuition, which is... Uh, a lot of money, right? So you will not come out in debt from having paid MIT tuition uh, for two years. Uh, we uh, assign you, you, you indicate your interest in a particular lab when you apply, we, we assign you to a lab, but we try to be flexible. Like We, we want to make a good match, um, and we generally do, but we want to make sure that you, we try to make sure that you're happy in your lab assignment. Um, there's uh, there's a well. I'll, I'll tell you about the core in a few minutes. Um, so we'll wait to get to that and to give a sense of the courses you'd be taking uh, if you were here. And I'll just mention that in addition to the coursework, there's a kind of team emphasis that a lot of people doing working in groups and getting engaged in, um, you know, doing speaking engagements, publications involved in service organizations, going to conferences together, um, this kind of thing. And, you know, when you're in a research lab, you might end up traveling somewhere, let's say over IAP independent activities period, um, you might end up going with your lab to Sri Lanka to gather data or something like that. So um, that's, I just made that up, Sri Lanka. But uh, <laughs> you go to different, we do go to interesting places over, um, you know, um, throughout the year and, and over the breaks and over the summer. And over the summer, um, uh, a lot of Shannon remind me over IAP you are uh, you may be expected to work in your uh, research right. lab, yeah. but over the summer it varies. Yes, it depends on the lab. It depends and on the, the discretion of the student and at the discretion of the student. Um, so many students between their first and second year will work on gathering data or reading lots of books or writing or whatever it takes to gear up towards their thesis, which they'll be writing in their second year. It's a very um, intense program. And, you know, even, you know, sometimes the first or second day, the new students are like, wait, I'm supposed to know what my thesis is now? But actually, we try to bring in students who we feel like are tough enough to early on be like, yeah, I have some really definite ideas. And then you fine tune them and hone them. And some people shift directions. Um, but we are looking for people who come in with, you know, some sense of their, of their purpose, why they're here, what they want to pursue, maybe afterwards, or at least in terms of their thesis. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, that covers that. Uh, so what, what does it mean to be comparative? <laughs> what do we do across media? We do transmedia work, that is computational media, uh, the book, the history of the book, games, television, film, and video. We do trans-historical work, thinking across historical periods, um, trans-cultural work, and transdisciplinary work. And I think the transdisciplinary thing is one of the things that will, will really hit you the most if you're looking at our website and you look at, let's say you're looking at other schools to apply to. Um, Often within a program, you'll say, oh, everyone in this program went to an anthropology, has an anthropology PhD, or everyone in this program studied, you know, was a film studies major, or, you know, this kind of thing. You, you get a sense of, of uh, cohesion, right? We're cohesive, but diverse at the same time. We have a lot of different uh, disciplinary backgrounds in the humanities, in social and computational sciences. Um, uh, Vivek, for example, American Studies, right, as a PhD. I was in a film program in an English department studying television. Um, Mike, what was your... Informatics, part of computer science. Informatics, mm -hmm. yeah. So that just gives you a little taste. Uh, Ian Condry, who'll be later, was in anthropology. Um, so it's kind of all over the place, but we make it work. And that's part of what's fun <laughs> and exciting is exposure to all these different methods and approaches and backgrounds. Um, who are we? Here's a sample of who we are. Uh, 
presented via headshots. Look how short my hair used to be just <laughs> two years ago. <laughs> so it gives you a sense of, of who we've got here. And, and, and some of these people introduce themselves. I believe Sasha is coming as well. But I mentioned Ian Condry, our anthropologist who works on Japan. Sasha over there is civic media. Federico is um, a professor of the practice who runs the mobile experience lab. Vivek, who will describe his research in just moments. Uh, Fox, who does computational work and runs the um, ICE lab, Imagination, imagination Computation and Expression? Yes. Yeah, ICE. Um, me, I'm a historian of television, um, broadcast media. I also work on conservative media culture. Um, Nick Monfort, who does um, experimental poetry. That's not the right way to put it. Um, he computational experimental poetry. He literally teaches machines how to generate poetry for him. And he look like one of his side projects now is a book that is entirely written with three letter words. Um, I believe it's called One for the Win. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I was in a car trip with him once for four hours, and he was like, let's talk about three letter words. Come on. <laughs> and he was just writing down all the three letter words. <laughs> Very intense about his words. It's fantastic. Uh, Jim Parody, unfortunately, couldn't make it. He's teaching right now. He works on uh, digital humanities and surveillance. Uh, Jing Wang uh, is just uh, started an NGO. Is it NGO 2.0? Correct. If I remember correctly. Um, so, uh, William Mauricio does kinds of things, television <laughs> history, film history. He's got a book coming out on algorithms right now. He is the most prolific and wide-ranging scholar, um, one of them that I can imagine. T.L. Taylor um, is a, a sociologist who focuses on gaming and uh, competitive uh, public e gaming events. Esports, thank you. Esports, you can tell I'm not a video game person. You know, that thing with electronic sports. Esports. Um, and Ed Chiappa is the head of our program uh, overall of, of CMSW. Um, and he's in rhetoric and persuasion, um, does a range of media work and sort of classic rhetoric work. Um, to give you a sense of some of the more contemporary work, he's got a piece, I believe it's on Michael Morsico, where he's um, looking at attitudes of people who view the film and how they are affected by the film, just to give you a specific example. So that's a little bit of who we are. Um, we, as you know, have a number of research labs. These are all up on the um, website, Civic Media Ice Hyper Studio, which is for digital humanities, mobile experience. Um, and I, is Federico coming? No. No, okay. Um, the Game Lab, Open Documentary, and the Creative Communities Initiative, the Trope Tank, that's Nick Montfort's uh, project, and the Educational Arcade. So um, they do distinct things, but there's also clearly some overlap. Education Arcade, for example, using you know digital tools for education is going to overlap in certain ways with Game Lab in terms of the end product, I think, right? That's fair mm -hmm. to say. Um, here are the lab directors to give you a sense of the faces that go with uh, each of these labs. Um, we also have visiting scholars and uh, postdoctoral fellows. Um, some of them are associated with research labs, but not always. Sometimes they teach a course while they're here. Um, so we just have a lot of talented and interesting people passing through. And these are just three examples. If you go to, you can see there's a link there. If you, well, you can't really see it, but you can find it on the website. Um, to all of our postdoctoral and visiting scholars. So, for example, uh, Teresa Rojas is a comic scholar uh, who was a pre-doctoral fellow and now is a postdoctoral fellow. It worked. She finished her dissertation and stayed on and teaches uh, a, a range of courses for us, including comics, which is fabulous. Um, Marie Therese Mader uh, works on religion and media and culture. She's doing a lot of field work on Mormon media production. Um, She's fun to talk to about the Book of Mormon. <laughs> um, and uh, Sandra Rodriguez is uh, a documentary filmmaker, among other things, associated with the Open Doc Lab. So this is just a little sample of some of the people we have passing through. Some of them are here for more than one year, some of them just for uh, one year at a time. Um, this uh, reiterates, you know, this is directly from the website, but just gives you a sense of what the structure of things would look like if you were here. Okay, so in your first semester, um, it's pretty, it's pretty rigid, airtight, first semester, right? You're in media theories and methods one, to kind of give, our, since people come from a lot of different backgrounds, helps give you a common language for thinking about the theories and methods of media studies. Workshop one is a more sort of uh, hands-on, uh, team-oriented class, uh, often with computational work. Major media text um, is a class that I regularly teach that um, 
I know it's not a very revealing major media text. What is that? Gone with the wind, or you know, it could be sort of all kinds of things. Um, I'm teaching this this year around um, uh, electoral te major media texts of elections and thinking about political campaigns as texts. But the idea is you can take a range of content in this class as long as you are learning how to dissect text and look at how they're put together. So that's a tool that you could use in your thesis, even if your thesis is not text-based. Um, and then colloquium, which I'm hoping many of you will be attending today, is every Thursday uh, from 5 to about 7 o'clock. And we have a range of uh, speakers, some from out of town, some local folks, sometimes within our own department. Um, and uh, today we have an alumni panel. So this is a, a place to see a range of research, get a sense of different kinds of methods. Um, with When we bring in alums, it's useful for current students to see you know, what are the kinds of things you might do when you're graduated, uh, when, you're, when you're done, and uh, ask some questions, do a little networking perhaps, and then we eat uh, falafel or chicken on sticks. <laughs> or shrimp. We had shrimp last week. Um, so we had a little modest reception. It's very nice. Um, the second semester, you continue the theories and methods, too. That's a class I often teach. Um, and it ends with your thesis proposal. Okay, so with a which could change, right? Because then you have the summer to work on it. But the idea is you've, you're sort of lining up, putting all your ducks in a row, as they say, towards writing your thesis. And so you submit a proposal, um, a continuation of workshop. Uh, from the first semester and colloquium again. And then you have an elective, which, hooray, there's a million different things to choose from at MIT. Um, and also you can take classes at Harvard, um, at uh, Wellesley, at, which few people do because it's a bus ride. But it's there. It's an option. Um, uh, Mass Art? Mass College of Art. Yeah, Mass College of Art. So it's a range. But mo most people, if they leave MIT for that elective, end up going to Harvard. Um, and then in your second year, Media and Transition is a history class. Um, wow, that doesn't sound historical. Transition, right? But it's looking at transitions from period to period. So if you think about, for example, the rise of electrical communication, you could start with the telegraph in the 19th century, go into the telephone, television, or you could back up, like William Arricchio does work on television you know, from the 19th and 18th century. How is television imagined? Uh, as the technology was still slowly developing and didn't quite exist. Um, so it tries to mix up, get away from that kind of teleological historical approach and looks, looks at moments of transition as new medias emerge and new medias. Uh, there's a great book by Carolyn Marvin called When Old Technologies Were New. Right? All new technologies become old technologies. So that's a classic that goes into those issues. And then you've got colloquium again, and then two electives. Hooray. And then uh, in your last semester, you're, taking, you're doing colloquium and writing your thesis. Some people split the thesis up into two semesters. They sort of do half that first semester and half the second. And if that works well with your work style, that's a good idea. Um, OK, so then you write your thesis. And I'm, I'm sorry, this text is a little small, but these are um, a few samples of theses from a few years ago. Uh, one, uh, I, rather than reading through all these titles, because I do want to move on and stop talking so much, I'll just say that you can go to our website and see lists of former um, uh, theses that have been written by our students. And um, most of them are linked up. That is correct, right? All of them, yeah. yeah, all of them. There's a few rare examples. Like there's one person I know who worked on industry stuff and had interviewed a lot of people. And they were like, you can put this in your thesis, but it's kind of off the record. Um, and, she, and, she, and really, it was more, it wasn't full of... Uh, scathing exposés. It was just she wanted to go into the industry and she was like, I'm not sure I want all this stuff, you know. Um, so that one's available by request. But basically everything is up there. So you can take a look at what's happened before. They're generally 100 page uh, documents, three 30 page chapters, five page intro and conclusion just to give you a general idea. There's some variation um, and some of them have a strong creative component where someone say is doing a big data visualization project and then they might write less text and do more uh, coding. But usually it ends up around 100 pages. Um, uh, I'm going to skip that one. Um, Here's a nice example of one of our star graduate students who went on to graduate school. She's still in graduate school, Molly Sauter, but her book just came out um, about uh, civil disobedience on the internet with a strong focus on anonymous um, Molly Sauter. Um, there's a full list of our alumni online, so you can take a look. This is just a nice range of, you know, 
you can see the kinds of things they do. Digital director at Adult Swim, um, Audubon Doherty from 10, class of 10. Sam Ford from 07 is a VP of Innovation and Engagement at Fusion, which is an ABC Univision joint venture. Um, we've got Flourish Clink doing transmedia storytelling. Um, what's the name of her TV series? East, East Low High? Yeah. 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 Um, that's what she's, she's one of the big creative talents on that. Got someone at the NYU Game Center who's an associate arts professor, someone at Microsoft Research. So you can get a full list online, but that gives you a bit of an idea. I um, already told you about colloquium, so I'm speeding up now because I want to move on. Uh, we have a conference every other year uh, called Media and Transition. Uh, this one, unfortunately, we had to cancel. We were a little short staffed. Uh, we had so many. Uh, professors on leave because we all have these big projects to finish up and so on. Um, but you can read um, a kind of pre of you know, the last eight media and transition conferences and get an idea of some of the, they always have a central organizing theme. Um, and it's a sort of smallish conference where I believe we don't even have competing sessions. Is that right? Is it all, Correct. I think it's just linear. So it's a really interesting um, conference. Um, and that's really it. There's our back to home page of the website. Uh, so I want to open it up to, to Q and A, but I also wanted to hear from our visitors who come in. So maybe we could start with Vivek. Okay. Um, so my name is Vivek Bald, and um, I've been here uh, what, coming on seven years now since 2008, um, and. Um, my uh, background before I decided to get, I got a PhD later in life, and my background before that was as a documentary filmmaker, uh, but working very much in the DIY style, very small. Um, and um, my, my work, both in documentary and now as a scholar, uh, as a historian, has centered around um, specifically the South Asian diaspora and stories of migration and immigration. Um, from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh to the U.S. and Britain. Um, so my documentary films have included a music documentary about South Asian youth and music and anti-racist politics in Britain, um, another documentary about um, South Asian taxi cab drivers in New York City, um, and my current work is a little bit more historical um, about South Asian undocumented immigrants in the late 19th to mid 20th century who settled in African-American neighborhoods. And um, so that work is work that I'm now um, pursuing across different media. Um, so this last project that I mentioned, which is called the Bengali Harlem Lost Histories Project, exists as a book that was published in 2013. Um, and currently I'm working on a, a feature length documentary about the same subject as well as an interactive documentary slash or a history site, um, which I'm making sort of under the auspices of the Open Documentary Lab. Um, Is that website available and live at the moment? Not currently. No. Okay. What, no. Do we have an ETA? Because I, um, I want them to look. It's yes. so wonderful. I've seen <laughs> sort of the prototype. Um, I would say sometime in the spring. Late, okay. Late spring. Because what, I mean, he's got all these, I mean, you can probably describe it better than I can, but he's got these photos up and people go and they're like, that's my grandfather. So if you, you have unidentified photos and you invite people who, you know, say immigrants to New York at a certain time to look there and, you know, find their relatives and tell their stories and add them. So there's a level of genuine interactivity that I think is really impressive and interesting. There's, there's some weaker interactive, interactive documentary out there where the interaction is just like click on this and you'll see something different that if you click over here it's just you know doesn't strike me as very interactive and this is a really genuinely interactive project that grows and develops through the interaction with right. visitors and it's really sort of committed to the idea of people's histories and also um, histories of undocumented populations that have existed you know throughout the 20th century um, and trying to rec record document those story, those histories through family stories and family photographs, um, you know, in a kind of ongoing way. And the Open Documentary Lab, for those of you who are interested in that, um, is, is a relatively recent but very fast-growing initiative that we have here. Um, 
that is focused on new forms of documentary storytelling that have opened up with various different kinds of technological changes over the last decade, you know, from from kind of the ubiquity of of cameras on cell phones and what that does to documenting, you know, kind of political and historical events, um, to um, game and virtual reality interfaces as a way of um, telling what yeah. what might have been in and the past documentary nonfiction kind of story. And we should have the director of that research lab here later, Sarah mm-hmm. Wolves, yeah. so she can fill you in more and you can ask some questions yep. too. So, yeah, thank you. Thanks. Before we move on to Anika, um, I just want to note there's coffee and cookies over there, and you can get up at <laughs> any time. Don't worry about, like, it, you know, someone's talking, just like, go ahead. And one of them is only subtly marked decaf. So if that's <laughs> what you're going for or not, just take a look at the top of the box to be certain you're getting what you want. <laughs> um, but anyway, dig in. Um, Anika. Uh, thanks. Uh, so I'm a second year graduate student in CMS. And uh, before I came to the program, I, um, I studied journalism in my undergrad and worked as a journalist for uh, several years uh, as a science and technology writer um, in the United States and then also in New Delhi, India. Um, I also did a lot of work with um, collaboration within journalism and journalism innovation. So I started, while I was living in India, I started a grassroots network devoted to um, collaboration between journalists and other forms of technologists. Um, and, um, and then I also did a lot of work with digital product management within the media industry. And that was doing, that is what I was doing before I applied to CMS. And um, so one of the things that brought me here was this joint focus both on media historically as well as exposure to the technology-driven culture of MIT and the Media Lab. Um, and yeah, so that's, and then now I'm here and I'm doing my thesis work around um, issues of um, how user-generated content interacts with news organizations and using that as a, as a way to understand better how news organizations are reacting to changes in the composition and relation, the, the composition of and relationship they have with their audiences. Great, thank you. I think before we go to Mika, maybe Lacey Lord is here. Could you stand up and turn? I'm sorry, we don't have you sitting up here. But she is also a second year. Kind of stand yeah, stand up. Hey, and, everybody. And, um, my name is Lacey yourself. Lord. I'm also a second year master's student. Um, my background, I actually came straight here after undergrad. My background's in English literature. Um, and I came in thinking I wanted to work on transmedia type experiences. And um, I have worked on transmedia storytelling projects in the past. Um, my, I'm actually a research assistant with the, comparative, the Creative Communities Initiative, which is, um, it takes an anthropological focus. Um, so if you have questions about that, please let me know. Um, and my thesis work is dealing with um, tablet-based digital comics and particularly looking at considerations of the senses and how haptic additions like, change the comic experience and also how the panel relates to the screen itself. Um, so, yeah. That's great. Thank Thanks. you. Could either of you uh, mention just a few other thesis projects just so they have a kind of idea of what people are working on? Sure. I can actually, I realized when Lacey was talking, one of the things I didn't mention is that I'm a research assistant in the Mobile Experience Lab, also known as the Design Lab, um, depending on uh, the project involved. But, um, and, and I can, I'm happy to answer more questions about that lab for anyone who's interested. Um, and then in terms of thesis projects, we have a huge variety. One of our colleagues uh, who's working in the Center for Civic Media, so Sasha knows them well, is um, interested in uh, creating a new platform for live streaming, civic live streaming. So he's building that platform in partnership with uh, developers there and uh, hoping to actually launch that and or has started testing it in many different contexts. Um, called Deep Stream, right? Deep Stream, yes. Yeah. So Whatever. you can go um, you can go look it up if you're interested. So that's what he's doing is his thesis work. Another one of our good friends and colleagues is looking at, um, she she came in with a background in video games, and she's an avid player uh, as well. And so she's looking at, uh, she's actually working with Mike and looking at feminist narratives within video games, uh, which is really an interesting space. Um, whom else? Another one, Lily, another one of our um, yes. classmates is, uh, she actually did a lot of work in radio and she used, she's interesting because she kind of has used CMS as a chance to explore a totally different discipline. And so she has now um, started doing a lot of work with urban planning and she spent the summer doing a bunch of research in uh, New Zealand, working with an organization there. And she's uh, now doing a thesis 
related to urban planning and has people um, on her committee from that department too. Okay, so that gives you yeah. a nice sample. And we're going to hear from <laughs> Mike. Thank you so much, Mike. And then Sasha Casanza's talk just came in, who works in civic media. So we'll do that. You too, and then I promise uh, Q and A. <laughs> Okay. okay, so yes, my name is Michael Jacobson, and uh, I'm a research scientist at CMS, but I'm also the research coordinator for the MIT Game Lab. And uh, I think I can describe both my research and what the Game Lab does by how you might interact with me or us if you become a grad student here. So first of all, we have teaching. So we have, for instance, an introduction to a video game theory class, which uh, is a heavy reading class going through, the, in particular, the last 10 years of game studies, what are the big themes, what are the big topics and issues. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a great grounding for a grad student if they want to uh, write their thesis on anything games-related. Uh, I also use... Uh, uh, TA is from the program in that class, and that just makes you have to read uh, all the, that literature even harder. We also play games and uh, <laughs> practice uh, ana analyzing them and uh, writing criticism on them in that class. Um, I also teach another uh, advanced class only for grad students uh, on playful and social interaction design. So if you're interested in interaction design and exploring research questions by building things, that that is somewhere where you can take your project and it's more of a workshop type class where we work on them together and discuss the different topics based on what our projects are. Um, what we also do at the lab is um, uh, research. So um, my current project is on uh, Couch co-op gaming, and I've done sort of a critical feminist reading of how the second player is being treated in these games and by these socio-technical systems. Basically, what what you find is that there is this idea of uh, uh, the first player uh, being male, being a, a, a skilled gamer, and being someone that almost needs to be have their experience protected against what player two is going to do um, to mess it up when they get introduced into this picture. Uh, I think it's based on, on uh, old uh, negative stereotypes about female gamers that we need to get rid of. And um, actually, that's a little bit where uh, Curia Caldwell's uh, thesis project comes in, because as you said, uh, she's uh, interested in looking at um, uh, what we tentatively call warm interaction between players or between player and player characters or between different player characters. And I think that's a field that we can mine for coming up with better asymmetric co-op gaming experiences. So um, while I'm planning the next step of my project where I want to work together with developers on coming up with these new interaction modes in co-op games, She's looking at what could those be in terms of interaction modes that aren't just instrumental. Like, say you have a game and you need to uh, climb up a ladder. If you add another player, suddenly you need to cl climb on the other player to get over the wall. But it's kind of the same, same thing you're doing still. If we're introducing different types of interaction modes, like caring for other players rather than just helping them over a wall, if that's part of the goal of the game, then I think we can have more interesting interactions going. So that's the, the second way you can be involved. She's a research assistant in the lab, so she's working to, with me on this project in between my, my project and her thesis project. Uh, the third thing that is like the, the, the third pillar of what we're doing in the game lab is actually playing games. We think it's really important to not just... Uh, 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 study through books or other literature or think about these things, but we think we actually have to, or build these things, we have to also uh, do the activity itself to really have an inside understanding of what it's all about. So we're doing a lot of that, and we're involving the students a lot. We try to play games at least once per week. W what we're doing right now is we've been playing a, a lot of uh, uh, board games that have themes based around uh, uh, imperialism and colonialism. 
uh, and we're doing a critique. There's going to be a series of blog posts and, and maybe a, a journal article on the problems we see with how these themes are, are dealt with. My blog post is tentatively titled Stories of Imperialism and Colonialism Retold Somewhat Lovingly. So I think that's problematic. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's it. Thank you. Um, Sasha, would you mind coming over here? Because this is where our microphone is for the live stream. And I guess, is the camera right at the computer right there? Yes. Yeah. So stand behind any of the people. Maybe Sasha can just take my chair. Okay. We're starting to look like a group photo or something. (laughs) (laughs) I'll pull up another chair. Go ahead. Thanks. Thank you, Um, Vicky. Hi. Uh, So I'm Sasha Costanza Chak. I'm Associate Professor of Civic Media. Um, in comparative media studies and writing. Um, The work that I do and the kinds of projects that I work on uh, with students are projects at the intersection of uh, social movements and media and media technology uh, practices. And the way that we like to work is typically through participatory action research and participatory design. Um, So, for example, we have one a large project that we're working on, which is the Transformative Media Organizing Project, and we're working with LGBTQ and Two-Spirit organizations around the United States to learn about um, what what kinds of queer media activism uh, is happening now, what types of tools and technologies our organizations uh, sort of using, um, and w- that's paired with a Skillshare series where community organizers from groups that are working at different intersections um, of... Uh, uh, race and class and rural urban location and disability justice and the prison system and uh, and queer organizing um, are uh, every month sort of doing an online Skillshare where they'll talk a little bit about the work that they're doing and then do some type of hands-on um, yeah, uh, skill sharing with other groups that are participating you know, remotely via Google Hangout. So tomorrow, actually, uh, at noon Eastern, if you go to transformativemedia.cc, you can see a skill share by the um, twospiritjournal.com, which is a new um, project that's launching out of the work that we're doing um, um, to sort of highlight the histories of uh, various genders that existed um, in many native communities in the United States prior to settler colon- colonialism and the erasure of those um, other genders. Um, so we're doing that. Um, I, I teach this course that I, I am really proud of, which is the Collaborative Design Studio. And that course is different every time we do it, but um, the basic principle is always that we're partnering with a community-based organization or a number of them to develop some type of media or technology project uh, together. And in the past, we've focused on surveillance and counter-surveillance technology. Um, So we we partnered with the Cambridge Domestic Violence Working Group um, to develop um, a project around, you know, people who are being surveilled by their intimate partner who's abusing them and the different apps and tools that abusers are using and how do you detect if those apps have been put on your phone. Um, Or we partnered with um, Detention Watch Network, um, which is a nationwide advocacy organization that's looking at Um, the detention and deportation system um, under the Obama administration, which has deported over, you know, two million people since Obama came in, and they developed a sort of interactive uh, sort of mini documentary uh, piece about that system and um, what it means and where it came from and where it might be going. Um, In the spring, we're going to be doing the co-design studio focused on cooperative, um, worker-owned cooperatives, so there's this interesting conversation happening right now. Um, you'll probably see there's sort of a backlash happening around Uber and Airbnb. So there's a conversation about the on-demand economy and what it means for workers and what it means for sort of the future of jobs, um, as well as, of course, what it means in terms of, uh, you know, as consumers are access to these services. So the idea is that, you know, Silicon Valley is disrupting a lot of industries in ways that might be beneficial for consumers and in some cases might also be beneficial for workers, but they're also sort of setting themselves up as intermediaries uh, to capture a lot of value on the transaction fees from, you know, something like Uber taking a ride. So the question is, can we do disruption that does more than just replace the crappy old boss with the crappy new boss that has even more information about everybody in the system. And so in the spring, we'll be partnering with um, worker-owned cooperatives to develop um, new platforms for the on-demand economy that would be actually owned by the people um, doing the labor in these systems um, or their organizations. So those are some of the types of projects, and I think it's all sort of guided by 
um, sort of shared sort of commitments to these ideas, these principles of um, both research and making that's done in partnership um, with existing community-based organizations and that ends up sort of owned by the community that you're working with. So rather than sort of coming in to do sort of extractive uh, research about a community or get an idea for your startup that uh, you kind of like take from a design process that ends up sort of <coughs> benefiting you as an individual most or your company or the venture capitalist who backed you. Um, our sort of ideas are about like how do we build things in community um, with organizations that, em that already have emerged organically from communities that are most um, sort of targeted by structural racism, gender inequality, um, heteronormativity, et cetera. Um, so, great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I believe we ha we, it, we're we going to have some um, lab managers starting to come in around 3 o'clock. That clock is not adjusted for daily savings time. Um, <laughs> so uh, we have a good 17 minutes or maybe a little more for just Q&A, open discussion, and you can address your questions generally or to anyone specifically up here. Sure. Uh, I'm wondering about uh, what some of the grad students were saying about people who came in and then were pursuing a slightly different field from what they came into. So for me, my ethnographic work is um, in diaspora, but I also started working at a nonprofit that does literary advocacy, and I'm interested in doing stuff that helped me build tech for that setting project, and I'm wondering how much, how that's possible to do two projects within the span of a two-year thing, or it most likely will be streamlined into picking one. Can I, before you answer, can I ask that you either summarize or repeat the question for the microphone for our online viewers? Uh-oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this uh, person, what's your name? Jill. Jill. Jill has uh, two different projects and is one, and one of the, oh my goodness. Uh, <laughs> I was paying attention, but I'm having trouble summarizing. Um, she's wondering about, you know, in terms of how her end product, her thesis, is she going to be able to do both of these things? Will she have to merge them together? Um, and, you know, ultimately a thesis has to be focused on, you know, one thing. So um, in, unless your, your topics kind of merge toward each other in certain ways, um, you're probably going to end up pursuing one essay, a major project for a class, or even for two classes. I mean, they're different. You know, I, I encourage in my own classes, uh, you know, okay, the class is major in media text. Maybe you're not doing textual analysis, but is there a topic you can pick that would segue into a chapter of your thesis um, with further revisions and so on? And so um, there are different ways you can pursue, you know, separate interest sets. But you don't want to be overly ambitious with a thesis that is too ungainly and is more like a PhD dissertation than a master's thesis. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Um, I, to add to that, I was going to mention that both of the things that you specifically mentioned, but also I'm sure this is true for other people who have multiple interests, um, both of those, like both the tradition of like ethnography as a basis for analysis and drawing conclusions, as well as building um, tools for civic intervention and participation, are things that have like a strong tradition within CMS, as well as a really rich and vibrant community in the broader Cambridge area. So. Um, I know that people have also kind of addressed that by potentially participating in like working groups or finding other partners um, to work on projects. Mm -hmm. For example, like this, the second um, space that you mentioned is I think you could find people who would be really interested and have a lot of experience and be willing to talk about that with you even outside the thesis environment. And I think people do do that yeah. um, as well. Thanks. That's helpful. Yeah. yeah, and it points to, I mean, there's a lot of resources in Cambridge, Massachusetts, it's like a yeah, or you know, in the area in Boston too. It's like a kind of brain trust in a lot of ways. So you can always it, it, you can reach out and find things outside of just mm -hmm. this little tiny area. Yeah, it's hard not to find them. Actually, there's so many. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Can ask more questions. Yeah, yeah. Can yeah. I ask a question? Sorry. Oh, sorry. No, you. You're here. You go. Oh. Hi. Um, I, I had a question more for the students in the program. I know you said that you came straight from undergrad. Mm -hmm. I too, I'm a senior now in undergrad, so I was just um, asking, do you have any tips for people who don't have these years of professional experience who are coming straight from undergrad, how to strengthen your application and what to focus on when you are applying? I'll just um, repeat, if you come straight from undergrad, how do you strengthen your application? Since a lot of people applying have more experience, et cetera. So general tips, I will say, um, I thought it would be more of a, a, I thought there would be more of a difference between me and other students who had had 
more years of experience. And really what it boils down to is that there really is not a whole lot of, of difference in how the program works for you. I will say general tips in, as far as like focusing, um, like when you're applying, I took the route of focusing on projects that I had worked on um, and kind of, they were very like CMS in focus in a lot of ways, so that kind of helped. But um, I essentially, you know, provided projects that I worked on and said, here's how this would fit into what I would like to do with my master's. Um, but I, I would I would say don't worry too much. Um, <laughs> I think it'll be fine. Um, if you have other specific questions, let me know. Awesome. Yeah. And I'm sort of coming from the flip side of that, where I've been working for a few years. So I'm just wondering, like, of the applicant pool, like, is it mostly undergrads with a few professionals, or is it kind of equally split? And the makeup of the class is 10, 8 to 10 students. Is it typically even? Right. The, the question was for someone who's been working for a few years and wants to get a sense of what the mix is of the, the kinds of applicants we get. Um, and uh, it's a mix. Uh, we generally get fewer people straight out of undergrad. Um, and those people who we accept are straight out of undergrad are, are special um, because they have a special sense of direction and so on. Because often there's a just a kind of... Uh, Maturi maturation as a, as a scholar, as an intellect, as an activist, whatever you're doing that comes with having a little space in between. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, in many ways you're at an advantage for having done something between the two, you know. Um, but I would say in your application, don't be worrying, like, how can I spin this? Just say what you're interested in, what you want to do, <laughs> okay? Yeah. As far as the breakdown goes, I will say our cohort has... Um, uh, most, has quite a wide range yeah. of career. Yeah, so on one hand, we have Gordon, who has been working for many years, and we have a few other people who've been working for years. Um, and then on the other end, we do have a few people who are either, I'm just out, but then there are a couple of that have only had like one or two years between undergrad and grad. And I would say the new cohort is a little more skewed to the just like a couple of years yeah, out of mm -hmm. school um, age range, but yeah. still still varied. And, we, and when we put together the class, we're seeking diversity on a variety of levels, and we like to have a cohort that, you know, they're not all similar, right? They all, they're doing different kinds of things, and sometimes if we're debating between two candidates, it's, it's not, they're both great, it's just their work is too similar. And which one can we pick? Which, you know, which one is a better fit? So we really want to have an interesting range of people. Um, other questions? Um, hi, my name is Chelsea, and um, I'm wondering if you expect from prospective students to come in with a specific research method on top of the research goal, because, or do they have more opportunity to explore a lot of methods of their first year? Because for me, for example, I am interested in designing a social platform or technology to include digitally isolated people, and um, I was wondering if you're looking for a more specific method to mm -hmm. do that. Right. So the question was, so we're looking for people who come in who have already sorted out their method, what they want to do and how they will do it. I can answer that, but does anyone else want to address it? Who's like my friend? With thoughts from your <laughs> I mean, we're here to learn things together, you know. So uh, if, you, if, we, if there's no reason for us to accept students who are already really done, you know, they already know all the answers, they've all sorted out everything, and they're just going to, you know, check us off their list or something. We want them to come in and experience new things, and you know, you're. If you really, if you came in without enough background to even have a sense of what's a method and why should I have one, like that's, you're too raw, right? Mm -hmm. But if you come in and you're like not sure what kind of method you want to use while you're here, well, that's why we have classes called Theories and Methods 1 and Theories and Methods 2 <laughs> that are your core required classes to introduce you to a variety of methods and get you thinking about which one is the right match for you and, and how you want to pursue it. Um, and some people come in already knowing, I'm an ethnographer, this is my method, this is my, you know, my research questions, and they pursue that, or they get here and they're like, actually not so much, I really want to look at uh, this instead. And so that, that can happen too, and that's productive. That's not like a mistake, that's a good thing, because you're learning and growing. Well, I'll, add, yeah, sorry. I'll, yeah. I'll just add something to that, which is that it is, it is really valuable to, you know, figure out before, or in the process of doing your application, you know, which of the research groups you're most yeah. Drawn to mm -hmm. um, that will you know that's you'll, you'll have seen that's a question on the application and it's important that you not just kind of check it off and say well this one sounds great but really do some research on them so that you can talk meaningfully in your application about why what you want to do might fit within the goals of the research groups. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's really helpful. Yeah. And I think some people will check off like all the research groups. Don't do Be- that. Don't do that. <laughs> um, they think they're being helpful. Like I'm so flexible. I like everything. But actually, it's more helpful for us to you know limit it and you know see really where your where the best fit might be for you. Mm-hmm. Heather, can I toss in a question or two from the interwebs? Can I say a thing more? Yes, about <laughs> Uh, oh, that's straight in my eyes. Uh, <laughs> I, no, I just wanted to say also that we, we are looking for people who are, have a strong sense of direction and know what they want to do when they come here. But I also think that if you ask the students who have graduated, that most of them would agree that the years they spend here is a deeply transformative experience. It might be in terms of which methods you're using or a theoretical framework, but it could also be like on the level of your worldview. <laughs> so uh, I, I think that's, after all, what we're aiming for here to to uh, create change in you as, as persons and as scholars. Uh, but that doesn't mean we want to see a sense of direction already when you're applying. So we have a few questions coming from our online participants. Do you want to stand over here so I don't have to repeat your question? Or do you sure, think you're... Sure, yeah. um, Thanks. Hey, Andrew Webbs. I'm the person who's uh, answering the chat. Uh, the question was, what does the program look for in a candidate? What makes a strong candidate and a strong application? And especially, they were very concerned about GRE scores. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that resonates. <laughs> My GRE scores in math were not very good, <laughs> so I'm sympathetic to those people. You know, uh, you know. Okay, I shouldn't say. It. But um, uh, we we don't have a numeric cutoff like this is the GRE. You know, um, and I believe the scores come in with percentages. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So what percentage? Are, so that's very helpful for me when I'm looking at applicants. I'm like, if you're in the bottom thirty percent in your verbal skills. That's a red flag that you know you don't have the skills that you're going to need here. Um, but once we get above eighty percent or so, I'm like, okay, you you may be a poor tester. You may not be good at these standardized tests and so on and so forth. So there's no hard like this is the number where we cut off um, on GREs. Um, we do uh, see your GPA as an undergrad, and you know that's relevant. You know if you're a straight C student, you're probably not a good applicant for us, and you might th- you all might be thinking. I'm here because I'm a straight A student. That's great, but you know we get a range of applicants. So, um, so there's a level on which numbers matter. Um, you submit a writing sample, and uh, that is something people ask a lot of questions about. What are you looking for in a writing sample? And it's great when a writing sample feels like a really strong match with what we do here in terms of the topic area. Um, but at least when I'm reading them, um, I'm also thinking, you know, who's a good writer who can really express him or herself well? And so uh, if I get a, a, a writing sample on a debut C without a technical angle of like modern incarnations, of, you know, that doesn't seem directly relevant to our transmedia project, I don't automatically go, well, that's not really right. I look at, well, what's the writing? What's the argumentation style? Try to be flexible. Um, about the topic. Um, if you have something that's very relevant to us, that's great. Uh, but some people have a sort of finite group of undergraduate papers, and they're like, this doesn't seem exactly right, but it shows how I express myself. Great. Send that Send that in. So hopefully that, that helps a little bit. I don't know if anyone who has, has anything to add who's... Um, yeah. I have a um, sort of an elaboration of that also. Sure. I seem to remember that when I was doing the application now, like a couple of years ago, um, there was a space where I could put in like links to additional portfolios and work, mm-hmm. and I think mm-hmm. I sent links to some of the journalistic articles mm-hmm. I had done. Mm-hmm. And I'm wondering if, I think there's still a space where people can submit like artistic work or a design portfolio yeah. or maybe even a tech portfolio, yeah. and that's something that's looked at also. Yeah, that can be very uh, useful to see, well, this person's doing interesting podcasts or they have a blog or just to get a sense again of how they express themselves and so on. Yeah, that's still part of the application process and that can be very handy. I think in general we you know we look at all these all the different elements of the application um, you know quite holistically. There's no one mm-hmm. thing. Yeah. Um, uh, but certainly certainly as we've as we've said that um, we're we're looking for people who have some um, some clarity of direction in terms of of why they've chosen to go to graduate school, why they've chosen this particular school, um, yeah. and uh, and 
having a clarity, uh, the clarity of uh, a project that that person wants to pursue is also, yeah. you know, really um, important thing to see. Um, even if, as people have said, even if once they're here, it might go in other directions. And I'll add, um, this is a question students often have, and Shannon, can you help me with this? Um, of the, no the, the, the recommendation letters, there's a certain number that need to be scholarly versus we like it if they're if they're all scholarly. Yeah. But um, if you if that means you're calling up someone that um, you haven't had a class with since freshman year and they probably can't remember you, don't use that person. Right. Use your, someone who knows you well and who can really respond to your yeah. ability to succeed in graduate school. Yeah. So we we like all the recommendation letters to be scholarly, but if there's one there from, you know, you were just uh, a journalist and uh, interesting. You know, working in a magazine or newspaper, and your boss writes a good letter for you. Like that's fine. That's a nice part of the of the package. But we wouldn't want all the letters to be from that direction. In most cases, there might be some exceptions, but that's the kind of rule of thumb. Uh, Kurt Fent just came in. Uh, do you mind? We we have we're we're live here, and we can only really hear people if they're standing in the area of this microphone. Would you guys mind coming back here? Yeah, yeah sure. Um, uh, and introduce yourselves. And uh, this is uh, one of our grad students who's working in the lab with Kurt. Are you Sorry. done with the projector? Uh, yes, I am. Okay. Why don't we just turn it off? So Why don't we just turn it off so that we're not? Although I like the spotlight. Okay. <laughs> well, it was a, do you want a certain? Do you, you want know, to sing a song or something? Text, text to Kurt. No, no. I don't yeah. want to empty the room. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have to go teach, but uh, I'm looking forward to reading your applications. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Great. Welcome. It's great to see so many of you interested in, in, in CMS. Uh, so my name is Kurt Fent. I direct HyperStudio Digital Humanities at MIT, and that's... I'm Evan. Uh, I'm a first-year student, and um, one of my lab is HyperStudio. Yeah, exactly. So we want to briefly talk about, you know, five minutes, sure. um, what HyperStudio does, uh, and also how a graduate student, an RA in HyperStudio, is involved in the work that we do. So primarily, HyperStudio deals and explores the ways digital technologies impact the way we do research and we teach and learn in the humanities, arts, and social sciences. So that's basically the, the, the framework for that. Uh, as part of that, we work with faculty at MIT and other uh, universities outside. We also have international collaborations on projects that explore, on the one hand, on a scholarly basis, how can we rethink how we do research. Uh, one of the projects, for example, is with Jeff Revel here in, in this building. He's in history. He's a um, professor of uh, um, theater history, French theater history. So it's exploring how <clears throat> ticket sales uh, of the Comédie Française, which is the major theater in, in France, it was the th uh, troupe of the king, how they built their repertory and is really looking at the ticket sales from 1680 on, how decisions were shaped by influences from uh, the political side, uh, from uh, you know, the, the creative side, and so on. So we build tools that allow that, but also engage you know, an international audience of scholars uh, in, into that uh, project. Some of these projects are ongoing for a very long time, uh, and we've had many graduate students and RAs involved in this project, looking at data visualization, doing other kinds of research. So that's one of the possibilities. Uh, another project that we do in the educational realm is a project that's called Annotation Studio, and that looks at digital aspects, collaborative community aspects of close reading. Uh, and how this is shaped by a social environment in which students go very deep into uh, a text. It could be a media text. Right now it's primarily written text, but it will be media text fairly, uh, fairly soon. And how to make connections to other uh, texts. For example, when you read Moby Dick or any other literary text, of course th they are precursor texts. You want to make connections to those. There are um, implementations and adaptations in uh, different kinds of media. You want to link to those. So it really brings up a different understanding of a text uh, and uh, you know how this could be read and shared and, and used for interpretation in a different way. 
So this is, these are just two of the projects that we work on, and it's always a, a co-designed approach. We work with faculty very closely, and I'm sure um, um, you've heard about co-design, you know, which, which is a very important aspect uh, that we do. Faculty are involved in the team, the developers are involved, the RAs are involved in, in the team. Uh, and this is really important. We look at the actual need uh, that faculty, students, or other scholars have uh, in this project, and then we decide, you know, what's the best approach to do that? It's never that the technology is at the forefront. You know, t technology comes in, we use open source technology, our uh, technology is open source, um, and so on. So that's, we do that uh, in, in a range of different projects. Right now we have four or five, five ongoing projects right now. But always, you know, there are different stages. Um, and we also teach a class in uh, digital humanities. Uh, we contribute to other classes, um, right? And one of the graduate students, or, you know, depending on next year, might be more, you know, are also involved as TAs. Uh, in this class, we have an outreach. Uh, you know, we do occasionally talks, uh, workshops, and so on. And we have a weekly newsletter, which, you know, it's called H plus D uh, Insights. And this is a great newsletter because it basically gives, you know, sort of our perspective on digital humanities, what's going on. And right now there are about 700 subscribers to, to that newsletter. So it's, it's a really great, and the newsletter is always done by one of the graduate students. So I'll hand it over to Evan so he can talk about what he's working on. Um, <coughs> Oh, yeah. I also have to go, so... Um, thank you for coming. Thank you all, and, and any specific questions, feel free to email me. Um, thank you. Great. Um, do you want to sit down yeah. right here? Yeah. Um, hey, I'm Evan again. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, I work on a couple different projects at Hyper Studio. Um, the main project that I spend most of my time working on is a... It's sort of a collaboration with um, a, one of the writing professors, so like the W and the CMSW, um, and his name's, his name's Ken Manning, and he, he writes about, um, mostly about like African-American scientists, um, and so he's had this, he's had this uh, archive that he's been collecting over the past few decades of um, biographical records of um, black medical professionals from 1860 to uh, 1980, and it's, it's like, at this point, it's, it's up to 23,000 um, different specific doctors and they have all this great like associated material that is um, like correspondence, unpublished uh, works, autobiographies, like this whole treasure trove of, of content. And um, so, so Ken really wanted to get that content out there for scholars and, um, and just lay people to, to start looking through and using um, in their own work. And so I think um, I was, you know, very early on assigned to this project when I first came in. But the great thing about working um, half, uh, in HyperStudio is that we can we can use a lot of the the HyperStudio tools and, and resources for this content to create like sort of an online archive for it. Um, and and yeah, so so this is what I've been spending most of my time doing. And um, as far as like what I actually uh, do in terms of concrete things, it's it, there's sort of like three different categories. I do I spend a lot of time doing research, um, like down in the archives, looking through the different documents and cataloging them and getting to know them and getting familiar with. I also um, spend a lot of time thinking about the what the final product for this will be, what the the archive will be, um, how it will function, who's going to use it, what they're going to need to access, how they're going to need to access it. Um, and then also just doing sort of uh, promotional work. Um, like right now I'm writing a blog post about it. We've applied for um, a conference presentation about this um, this resource. Uh, so yeah, um, as far as like what my actual time in lab is, is done, it's sort of a combination of those three things. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, do you guys have some questions <coughs> for them, or more generally? I have no break. Um, so this is a question that I guess is directed at everyone, but maybe perhaps mostly for the currently enrolled students. Um, certainly, I'm really intrigued in the way that CMS is bringing together a diverse range of approaches to media, diverse approaches, diverse labs. And I'm wondering if there, and there's certainly a lot of collaborative opportunities within CMS as a program, and I'm wondering if those collaborative opportunities also resonate across MIT as a broader organization. Uh -huh. um, certainly, you, you mentioned earlier the ways in which there are opportunities for people to get involved with communities here in Cambridge and Boston. And I'm just wondering, yeah, about the, the rest of MIT, the non-humanistic side. 
Right. So Jeffrey asks, you know, we collaborate a lot within it, within uh, CMS, but what are the opportunities to collaborate across MIT and outside of MIT and, you know, beyond? Yeah. Uh, I think people do that in different ways. It is, it's one of those things where you, it helps to have a sense of the people with whom you might want to collaborate beforehand. Um, it's a large institution. People are doing, especially at the graduate level, like very different work. Um, people don't, like, like institution-wide, people may not necessarily always be familiar with what's happening in each program. Um, I know from my own experience, I am one of my, so we have, when we do our thesis work, we choose a committee, and one of my um, thesis, one of my committee members, uh, one of my advisors is actually somebody who runs a group in the Media Lab, which is kind of a neighboring program to us, but is actually not the same program and is more engineering driven. Um, so that's an example of how, and that, that evolved really naturally from mutual interests. He was looking at issues and topics related to news and we became familiar with each other's work. And so that, that happened really, like that was a really good partnership. Um, I know other people have also taken that avenue, asked professors from other departments to serve on their advising committees um, in other ways as well. I'm trying to think if I don't really have anything to add to that. Um, it, it's definitely a very um, individual um, decision. Um, most of the people that I've interacted with outside of the department I've met at um, lectures or um, conferences in town and, you know, just having similar conversations in the same spot and then making a connection that way. Um, as far as, like, working on a collaborative project, it's mostly been CMS-driven for me, but that's not, like, a, a choice I've made. It's just mm -hmm. kind of how it's organically happened. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned all the talks because, you know, you can get on mail yeah. list and go to talks at Harvard, like, every day, mm -hmm. talks mm -hmm. here every day. Microsoft <coughs> Research is an amazing resource nearby where they have talks almost the once Berkman a week. Center for Internet and Society. Yeah, the Harvard. Berkman Center for Internet and Society yeah. up at Harvard. Um, and so you might spend, you know, one day go to talk on algorithms at Microsoft Research, then go to Berkman to learn about surveillance, then back to Microsoft to learn about comics, then over mm -hmm. here to learn about uh, Japanese music. We had a colloquium on that. You know, so... It's, there's so many opportunities in a way you, you come in so like stay ambitious it's good to come in ambitious <laughs> but then you realize like there's only so much I can do in, in two years That's and so you sort true. out like okay I'm just going to collaborate this yeah. small way as opposed right. to you know and I think also as part of the, the all research groups of course have collaborations with the outside yeah. Yeah, you yes. know, with, with, yeah. with different mm -hmm. groups and you know international collaborations so so that's where it comes in as well you yeah. know mm -hmm. these, these connections yeah you might be doing a conference internationally through a research group or you might be building a product for Mitsubishi and the mobile experience lab or you know there's all kinds of different uh, ways that you're reaching outside of the Institute yeah or just just the project I was just talking about is with someone who's sort of outside of CMS proper. Um, but yeah. Yeah, he's on the W side. He's on the, w the other side, side so of the slash. It's getting yeah. close. We're all together, uh, you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. And then also, I mean, I haven't, I haven't really experienced this yet, but I have to imagine electives is a big way that you can sort of um, like get, get outside of the CMS bubble, but also mm -hmm. get outside of the MIT bubble and take classes mm -hmm. at Harvard. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, absolutely. When it comes to the game lab, I think most people here don't think of it as a CMS thing. It's most of our undergraduate researchers are from Course 6, for instance. So, Which uh, is Course 6 oh, is computer, computer science. science and electrical engineering. Sorry. Electrical engineering, thank you. Uh, yes, so uh, we do have that sort of mix of different kinds of skill sets that is needed for the types of projects we do. And we, we collaborate a lot with, with uh, outside uh, interests. Uh, so if you're a, an RA for us, you will be expected to uh, probably travel both in North America and Europe with, to follow our different projects and uh, get sent to different conferences. So, like that. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, um, this question, I think it's for you. Um, you mentioned you were working at the creative communities. Thing. Yes. So did you tell us about the community? Yeah, definitely. I think the Ian question was about the Creative Communities Initiative, and you can fill us in, but Ian is supposed to, he has a meet, he had a class at rental 3 and then a meeting at 3.30, so any second now he may rush in and give a quick presentation of himself, <laughs> okay. but meanwhile um, you can I will. In. I will preempt his, his explanation. Um, so, uh, the Creative Communities <coughs> Initiative is one of the newer research groups, um, and the two primary professors are Ian Condry, who is an anthropologist, and T.L. Taylor, who was mentioned before, she is a sociologist. And Ian's work has been mostly with, uh, he, he wrote a book on Japanese hip-hop and um, the soul of anime, 
Hi, Kyrie. Um, this is Kyrie Caldwell. She's also a graduate student. Yay. Um, she was mentioned before. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so um, CCI is this, uh, we, we basically focus on ethnographic work. Um, and I will take a, a moment. Um, so it was mentioned that placement for research groups is we, we do, they do that very carefully and that is mostly the, so usually you end up in a place where you have experience and, but um, I for one didn't have much ethnographic experience before um, but it, it did turn out to be a great fit but um, <laughs> I just wanted to put in a plug that um, most people end up in a place that they expect sometimes you don't but it'll be great um, so CCI is um, focusing on ethnographic work um, this weekend, um, I'm going with the group to San Jose to a conference to do some ethnographic work. Um, last year, we did a collaboration with Baby Center, which was this online um, platform for mothers, mostly mothers, but for parents. Um, and so it's kind of a little all over the board, but we also do really great things, like we have guest lectures. We have a guest lecture coming today, which I'll have to duck out for soon. Um, and we do, we do readings together, which has um, been very helpful for me, especially since I didn't have that ethnographic kind of background. Um, Right. Thank you. Um, Kyrie Caldwell, one of our grad students, just came in, and so did Ethan Zuckerman. Um, are you uh, on a tight schedule that you no, need to rush out? Okay, so let's, maybe Kyrie can just introduce herself as a grad student quickly. And then, Ethan, do you have your computer because you want to hook up? Or, sure. Well, I have my we have, computer because I'm cause lost without it and I can't remember what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> because but if have, you'd like me to project some slides, I can. No, no, no. But actually, I'd <laughs> like, prefer you didn't. Excellent. Just <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Okay, great. So, Kyrie and then Ethan will That's talk great. to us. And then we'll have some more questions. Uh, hi, I'm Kyrie Caldwell. Um, so, CMS grad student. Uh, I'm second year uh, with Lacey and Nika here. Um, and uh, I work for the MIT Game Lab and the Education Arcade for my RA ship. So uh, I run around talking, talking about playing, uh, uh, promoting uh, in like kind of a cultural like let's have fun playing games uh, kind of way. So um, yeah, I actually just got out of uh, doing a lecture for one of our courses or one of the courses that. Uh, at least is takeable here, um, on uh, uh, gender and um, gender in Japanese games. So, so I was just talking about. So sorry if I seem a little frazzled. I've been hopping from teaching to teaching to. Which that class is also uh, taught by Ian Contrick, by the way. Yes, yes. <laughs> from CCI. Yeah, I just yeah, that topic. Right. <laughs> <laughs> These are the good I things, think all of this so gives yeah. you a sense of the pacing of things around here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, Ethan. Oh yes. Well, while Ethan is walking over, um, can I get you a question off the webs? One more internet question. Yes. All right. Hello out there. Um, can you talk more about the program's balance between theory and practice? For those of us who are especially interested in the creative side of new media, is it possible for a thesis proposal to be centered around a creative project in the game lab, for an example? Right. Talk about the relationship between theory and practice. For example, could a thesis be centered around a game lab project? Could you speak to that as a game lab person? Yes, I can. Yes. Uh, so uh, we, we definitely have those kinds of, of uh, thesis projects, not just in the game lab, but also in the ice lab and Nick's lab and so on. So yeah. we often do some kind of combination of uh, what you're doing is an artistic expression, but it also always has to have uh, some kind of research question that you're exploring through that work. So uh, it, it can't just be uh, a fine arts project. But it's very often some kind of balance between the two. Uh, right. Do you want to add something? No, I think, I think that that's very helpful. And we, you know, it, it sort of happens on a case-by-case -case basis. You know, what is the balance between the creative output you want to do and the research questions that you're pursuing? Uh, I'd like to add to that. Mm -hmm. um, we actually have two um, second year master's students working on their theses right now that are doing creative projects. Um, um, and I want to kind of put the plug in that if you do a creative project, you still have to create the thesis that has some sort of theoretical framework. Yes. So it's, it's a delicate balance. But um, I think they both are very happy to be doing creative work as well. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, and as in, if I were advising someone one of those theses, I would be like, be careful not to bite up more than you can chew yes. because yes. you can't actually design a whole new thing, you know, and write a 100-page thesis, and, you know, you, so often the thesis meeting is like, limit yourself, limit yourself, pull it in a little bit. 
Yeah. Ethan, could you come over? We're, sure. we're, we're live here, and no one can see you if you're sitting I, over I, there. Absolutely. Um, oh. I could just be a disembodied voice. <laughs> <laughs> you're just trying to force me to put my laptop down. I know what this is actually about. You're after my secrets. Um, uh, howdy, I'm Ethan Zuckerman. Um, I direct a research group uh, that's part of CNS uh, called Center for Civic Media. It's a group that's um, got participants both from the Media Lab uh, as well as from the CMS program. Uh, so right now I actually have four graduate students from the Media Lab. I have two graduate students uh, from CMS. That's a pretty typical ratio for us. Um, I should probably start with this weird term, civic media. For us, civic media is this idea that you can make social change by making and disseminating media and putting it out in the world. For us, that often means digital media, and particularly participatory media, so making social media, making blogs, putting out videos. But we see civic media really much more broadly. It's the whole art of making media and looking at the ways in which that might make change in the world. So some of the work that we do is around building platforms. So you can see some of the work that we do online if you'd like. One of the things that we released recently is called Fold. It's at fold.cm. And this is basically a, a novel form of publishing and content management system. It's basically a way of going after uh, a problem that we're seeing a lot of in online publishing, which is that despite the fact that there's so many things you can do with text online, mostly people treat web pages as newspaper columns. Uh, they run text, they break it up with an image, they run text, and then they have a diagram, and then they run some more text. And it's not actually a particularly good way to read or write. It doesn't take very much advantage of the power of the medium and the use of the hyperlink. So we designed sort of a new platform based around the idea that you have uh, eyes that move not just up and down, but left and right, uh, and you're writing in an environment where there's an enormous amount of rich information that you can link to and embed and otherwise uh, create. So Fold is, is a nice example of where someone might go with a master's thesis. This was a student over at the Media Lab. She did this as a master's thesis in design. We were able to pair her with a programmer to make sure that this actually launched during her time at the program. The two of them have now formed a company and are now taking venture capital and are trying to figure out is this a competitor to something like Medium, or is this something that might be useful, um, you know, for instance, in uh, a newsroom or in scientific publishing, something along those lines? One of my current students from CMS is now in his second year, in his thesis year. His project is called DeepStream, and this is basically a way yeah. of, of trying to add some context uh, to live video streams, so it's sort of a similar model. So one branch of what we do is platforms. Uh, a second branch of what we do might be thought of as um, crowdsourcing community data. So we do a lot of work uh, in the field. Right now our major field site is Sao Paulo, Brazil. And we're doing a lot of work helping small community organizations make maps of urban infrastructures. And the idea behind this is we're really interested in the question of how do you let citizens feel powerful and actually have change over their local environments. And so this often means working at a city level rather than a federal level. And it often means, it almost always means, letting the community that you're working with tell you what issues are most important. So we're going and working with sort of established community groups. They're identifying issues of urban infrastructure in their communities. We've been building a software platform that allows large teams of people to collect photos and videos, to geolocate them, put them on a map, and produce data sets that they can use for advocacy. And that work is now getting combined with work with sensors. We've just been building a, a low-cost audio sensor. We're starting to do a noise map of Cambridge. What does Cambridge <laughs> sound like at different times of day? What are the, the quiet and the noisy spots? And that's really a framework that's going to let us use a much richer set of sensors around air pollution and water pollution going forward. The third thing we work on is... Do you mind if I push the pause button on yeah. you for just a second? You're great without your computer, by the way. Um, but Ian uh, is on a really tight schedule. Yeah, do you want to finish, you want to finish the third? Yeah, sure. Yeah. sure. Okay. Let, me, let me back That's up the, the, the third point, and then I will uh, get out of the way for Ian, but and I'll stick around for questions. Yeah, yeah, that would be great. Okay. Thank you. Third thing for me, I do a lot of work Thank on you. media impact. Um, so a lot of people in the social change field want to know 
if they make media and put it out in the world, what sort of effect is it having? When Occupy introduced the idea of the 99% and the 1%, what influence did it have? When Black Lives Matter went out and essentially said, racism isn't over, in fact, it's something we have to be actively working on, what impacts has that had? We have a project that's been going on for eight years. It's called Media Cloud. You might think of it as LexisNexis, only open source and focused on digital media. And it's optimized so that we can map online conversations. When people are talking about a controversial issue, what's the language that they're using? And when activists are getting involved with that issue and trying to introduce new language, how successful are they with it? And I'd love to tell you more about it, but for now, I want to hand over to Dr. Ian Country <laughs> and the wonderful projects that he is Thank you, on. Ethan. Thank you, Ethan. And thank you, Heather. Yeah. Uh, so I'm Ian Condry. Uh, I'm a cultural anthropologist uh, here at MIT. I've been here 12 years. Camera. There's a camera there. Could yeah, you scoot right. over? Yeah. Where, oh, this camera. Oh, no, no, over here. The computer. Oh, Sorry, we're live there streaming. Is, we're live streaming. Hello, everyone out there. Hello. <laughs> streaming audience. Yeah. Um, so I'm an anthropologist, uh, and I, we have a lab called the Creative Communities Initiative. Uh, it's T.L. Taylor and I. She's a sociologist. I'm an anthropologist. But we're both interested in ethnography, doing field work, participant observation, uh, as a way of understanding connections between online and offline worlds uh, and their potential, their potential to bring new solutions to old problems. That's our tagline. But basically, uh, the notion is that it grows out of my own research and TL's research as well. Uh, I look at Japanese popular culture, uh, how cultural movements spread globally. Uh, my first project was uh, on hip hop in Japan. How does rap music take root in Japan? My second book was about Japanese animation. How did Japanese animation become a global phenomenon? And part of my conclusion was that at the beginning of sort of both of these cultural forms, uh, elites didn't get it. They didn't think this was going to be important. It wasn't going to go anywhere. Even in the U.S., hip hop at first was seen as not music. They're not even singing. They don't play instruments. Uh, this is not going to go anywhere. Uh, and yet, uh, communities of passionate, committed people uh, gradually grew audiences, worked on the forums, spread them around, found ways to connect to other communities, uh, and that change often comes from the margins into the center. So the, the idea is how do you find those communities that are going to bring about change? I think field work and being among those groups is a way to do it. Uh, in fact, if you spend time with people, if you spend time in these spaces, you can see what has a kind of positive energy, a forward momentum, a potential to reach across the boundaries that are out there already. Uh, so that's the idea behind the Creative Communities Initiative. Uh, I'm currently working on uh, music and the way music is recovering and a, really a vibrant space despite the impossibility of making money on recordings. Uh, that it, the prediction was music would disappear. It hasn't. It's actually gotten more vibrant uh, in the years since the recording industry has plummeted. Uh, and yet new ways, new kinds of business and social uh, connectivity has really made it a very interesting space. So that's my future project. TL is working on uh, eSports uh, and various kinds of online gaming communities. Uh, we have students uh, working on a variety of things. Lacey is one of our students uh, working on interactive comics and how that's shaking up uh, the comics world. Uh, we've had people studying uh, video games in Peru and how that got going. Uh, diversity in the tech set sector. Uh, Ghost workers in Africa is actually a kind of interesting intersection of politics and economics and cultural settings uh, that one of our students is working on as well. Uh, so there's a lot of possibilities. And basically, our focus is finding ways to use field work and ethnography uh, to understand media studies issues uh, in more detail and really open up the discussion of how change happens by looking at communities and being part of them in some way. Wow, thank you. That's the pitch. If you have one or two questions, I'd be happy to take uh, any questions. All right. Well, thanks. No problem. Thank you, Heather. I really appreciate it. All right. It. Yeah, I'm sorry. We have to, have to run to our yeah. lab meeting <laughs> now. Yes, I have but to thank leave you as well. I just wanted to say, though, if anybody would has more questions for me, please email me. Our, our emails are up on the site. Yeah. Um, so Yeah, you can go to a you. page of all the students. Um, phew. They say that MIT is like a fire hose of knowledge, right? So we're giving you the fire, like, oh my god, it's so much. Um, maybe uh, if anyone has any questions for Ethan, 
Uh, we could back up a little sure, bit. Sure. I'll even maybe just say one last thing, which is just sort of the work that people have ended up uh, doing in our lab. Mm -hmm. um, some of that work ends up focusing on building. Uh, so uh, my current um, CMS second year student, Gordon Mangum, is uh, doing the design work and a lot of the engineering on DeepStream, which is a, a pretty serious software engineering project. Uh, a lot of the work that people do with me is more traditional sort of cultural studies or communication studies. So uh, two of the sort of highlight standout theses the last two years. Uh, last year, Chelsea Barabbas uh, wrote a thesis with me uh, about the technology pipeline uh, and the ways in which uh, gender and race uh, we're playing into underrepresentation within Silicon Valley hiring culture. Uh, and that's actually work that's been quite influential in the sort of foundation and social change community. Uh, the Ford Foundation ended up using it as part of their jumping off for some of the work that they're using in this space. She is now uh, working for the MIT Media Lab, uh, leading research on questions of equity and equality within digital currency, uh, because we have a big lab over there focused on Bitcoin. Uh, and I'll just interject that she's at the colloquium at 5 o'clock. Oh, fantastic. So, yeah. so ask her all about that. Yeah. Uh, two years before that, uh, the standout thesis was uh, from Molly Souter, uh, mm -hmm. who did work on denial of service attacks as a form of protected political speech. Uh, this was really fun. I have done uh, a lot of the work on how denial of service attacks uh, serve to censor and silence dissident and human rights organizations in the developing world. So you would think that I would be the least likely person to be supportive on a thesis about uh, the ways in which these might be viewed as political speech. Uh, but she was real persuasive and real persistent and uh, wrote an amazing book out of her thesis called The Coming Swarm, uh, which she got published uh, within six months of graduation. Uh, she's now uh, in a doctoral program in Canada. Um, so uh, people go in all sorts of really interesting directions uh, from this, but they, they go very, very impressive and very cool places. Cool. Thank you. Any Back questions? to you. I have a question from the interwebs. Um, do you have projects at the intersection between international development and media? And is that something that will be a good fit for CMS? Uh, projects at the intersection of international development and media. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you bet. So I, I've been running uh, a website for 11 years called Global Voices. I'm one of the co-founders of it, which is basically an international newswire of stories coming from the developing world. Um, a lot of our work right now is sort of analyzing and understanding how media coverage in the developing world does and doesn't penetrate uh, into mainstream media coverage. Um, we did a little bit of work on um, attention to the Charlie Hebdo attacks uh, versus attacks in Baga, Nigeria at the same period of time uh, that the New York Times actually cited, their public editor cited, in talking about uh, deciding to change their coverage and uh, pay more attention to terrorism on a global scale. Um, so we have actually a lot of folks in our lab come in from a development background. Gordon, who's working on DeepStream, uh, actually has been doing media training uh, in the developing world for the last four or five years. Uh, Chelsea, um, who is now doing this work on Bitcoin, actually came from a, an international development background. And some of the side projects that people end up working on, not even their thesis projects, end up being very strongly connected to this. A project that Chelsea and a student named Jude Mwenda worked on last year was in using uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, drones, uh, armed with infrared cameras to detect charcoal being made in forests in Kenya. Um, so charcoal is, like, people think charcoal is funny, like charcoal is a super huge problem in sub-Saharan Africa. And the way that you make it is you clear-cut trees, you dig a big hole, you put the trees in, you light them on fire, and you bury earth on top of them. And what you really want to do is find uh, people making this and arrest them. And one of the best ways to do it is to find active fires. And it turns out that you can do it by heat signature. And while it sounds crazy to be using drones in Kenya, it turns out that drones are the cutting edge for what people do to spot wildlife to take rich Americans out on game drives. So what you do is you take the same drones that people are flying during the day to figure out where the lions are, you put a different camera and different software on top of it, and you start identifying where the charcoal is, and you go after the poachers. So yeah, we work on fun stuff. 
Wow. <laughs> That's so impressive. <laughs> um, Sarah, are you, Sarah Wolzen is out in the hallway. Are you ready for us? or? We've got a couple of questions directly for you, Sarah. So please awesome. Come in. She, okay. she, uh, great. Yay. She's from the Open Documentary Lab, or Open Doc, um, with two students who work with her, too. So um, if you want to sit here, and if the students could, could you guys, we're on, we're live streaming, so we can see each other. They can see us best if you stand behind us. Any? Yeah. No, no, you're out. Sorry. You're out. Yeah, you, you want to you want to stand in front of the screen. Oh, he knows yeah. where he is. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the Open Documentary Lab, um, we look at new forms of storytelling and look at the intersection of technology storytelling, how they change each other. Um, we're also looking at institutions. We just came out with a report yesterday about how legacy institutions are making the transition in digital work using. Um, experimental and collaborative works um, that interactive documentaries help them do. Um, we also, we build resources. When we started the lab, it was 2012, um, there was really no infrastructure for this very new type of storytelling. Um, and so we brought together curators and funders and technologists and storytellers um, all to really think about what does this field need and where do we fit in. Um, one of the things we've started to do is build resources. So the first thing we did was a project called Moments of Innovation, which looked at the whole history of, of nonfiction storytelling and showed that all these new processes we talk about, interactive, participatory, data, immersive, um, have long histories. And that when you think about a documentary, you really were... Um, unattaching it to an actual medium. So it's not film, it's not photography, it's many different um, media put together and it can come from anywhere. And so when, for instance, we look at data storytelling, we go back to cave paintings and what they did there. Um, so our participatory has a long process of, of, you know, we start with the Kodak camera and how that changed the ability for people to take their own photos and changed even what um, the notion of what a photo is. Um, so we do a lot of projects like that. The other one we have is DocuBase, which um, is a database that's tracking the people, technologies, and projects that are transforming documentary in the digital age. We put out, a, we collect documentaries, put them out there. We have case studies that the students work on. Um, we have playlists to help you guide you through it. We have a lab section that does all these um, behind the scenes to open up the process of what do this new kind of filmmaking is. Um, not filmmaking, documentary making. Um, and what we're finding, too, is it's requiring entirely new teams, um, entirely new relationships with audiences and subjects, which we no longer call audiences and subjects. Um, and it's just really rethinking what storytelling is, what the role of the author is, you know, that you're creating a place for conversation, that you're creating a process as opposed to a product, um, that you're having different kinds of impacts than you would with just putting a film out there. So those are the kind of things we're looking at. Um, we have a lot going on. We, we partner with a lot of film institutes, with Tribeca Institute. We're doing a media impact project with Sundance. Um, we have several projects, but one, we send students to Sundance every year to write about um, this new type of storytelling, try to get it out in the public um, with IDFO and, and uh, a documentary festival in Amsterdam. We do other projects, so a lot of collaborating, too, with different institutions. So that's what we do. Thank you. And so we have two students who are in the, participating in mm -hmm. this lab, yes. uh, first year and second year. <laughs> Yeah, sure. So I can talk a little bit about my motivations for joining this lab, actually. Um, my background is in producing uh, And you events. are Sue Ding. Oh, yes. And my name is Sue Ding. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Just for the record. Thank you. Uh, so my background is in producing public affairs documentaries, mostly for PBS. Um, you know, linear, broadcast, very traditional. And so I was really interested in Open Doc Lab as a way to explore other forms of storytelling, other platforms, other creative approaches, and to really meet people who are working in this field. I'm Dennis Turtum. I'm a second year CMS student, also with Open Doc Lab. And my background is in film, uh, in both like nonfiction and fiction film, or like hybrid art house. Uh, and I don't know, I think it's a pretty great lab. What you get to do is you go to Sundance, right, or IndieWire, or like I was doing case studies last year, especially on pieces like I did one on like a VR piece called Ascent and like a web documentary called Do Not Track. So it 
consists of basically doing in-depth study, like interviews and research and writing. And it is very rewarding. And right now I'm researching virtual reality and nonfiction. And it's kind of like looking at the convergence of games and documentary and also looking at new uh, 3D capture technologies and how it changes how you make media. Or like looking at 360 video and its relation to nonfiction. So, yeah, if you have any background in like media making or film or like documentary in any form, I think it would be a great fit. Okay, thank you. Can we open up? I've got some. Wait, just mm -hmm. hang on. All right. I want to make sure everyone in the room has their. Um, yeah. I actually have a question, um, and it's kind of for you, Ethan, of the Center for Civic Media. Um, I mean, I'm wondering how projects are kind of inherited by new students, because it sounds like, for example, the one in Sao Paulo is going on for yeah. many years. So how did that pass down happen? How are students introduced to the project? What is sure. the long-term engagement um, for yeah. those long-term projects? So I would say that we've got... Um, you know, two or three long-term projects and lots of shorter-term projects. So, first of all, every student ends up with her own project, um, either for the thesis or often something that, that she or he will end up sort of doing on, on one's own. Um, the longer projects tend to have staff members attached to them. Um, so we're mostly grant-funded. And so, for instance, on the media cloud work where... Um, you know, we've been doing that for eight years. There's now a staff team of like five or six people on that. And when students are coming in, we're helping you find a manageable bite-sized chunk of it that's sort of playing to your skill set and interests, and you're sort of getting ramped up by the rest of that team. Um, for projects that are more speculative, like Promise Tracker, where I haven't gotten anyone to really figure out how to pay for it, in part because we started working in Brazil and then the Brazilian economy collapsed. It was not my best move. Um, we are often sort of scratching for funding and sort of finding it in interesting places. And then um, students, in many cases, uh, may be sort of building it at the same time as we are. So there were th two CMS students involved with sort of our first trip to Sao Paulo doing uh, the interviewing work and sort of designing the protocols and, and sort of uh, doing our first sort of uh, community projects there. Um, so sometimes it's in the startup phase, sometimes it's in the inheritance phase. When it is the inheritance phase, it's almost always in a case where we have a certain amount of institutional knowledge from a staff team uh, that's on board and able to help out. Is that helpful? Um, maybe another one from the room, and then we can do an internet. Yeah. So um, I know definitely each lab and research group have plenty of opportunity doing different type of research and often already funded by certain founders. But how about those uh, like us when applying already carrying some projects with them? It's not mm -hmm. like we have multiple choices, but we have been working for a while, and there will be uh, independent scholars or certain organizations we have been working with. Will we be able to bring in this project while, while we are luckily joining the program? Mm -hmm. Wow, that's an interesting question. Um, did you have a, were you about to say something? Yeah, I, yeah. yeah I'd love to. Okay, um, great. Could you repeat the question? Yeah, Sorry. sure. So the question was uh, for people who are already uh, interested in applying to CMS and have projects that they want to do, um, how does that sort of interact with what they do in the lab? And um, I think one thing that's interesting and, and worth mentioning, because I had the same question when I was applying, is that um, many students don't do their thesis work in partnership with the lab. Some do, where there's a really like strong overlap or you know it makes sense from an agenda perspective. But it's also very doable to do your thesis um, alongside your lab work. It is, I mean, it's both are significant commitments, but um, that's what I'm doing for a fact. Like my thesis, um, which looks at news organizations and um, like comment spaces, is quite, uh, is quite different from my lab work in the design lab. And that's fine. And, and in your case, you came in with a very clear knowledge of what you wanted to do. You were in my office a week after you got <laughs> yes. here saying, this is what I want to work on. Right. And, and, uh, and that doesn't always happen. Uh, yeah. But it does sometimes. So, so I would say um, maybe there's three things that, that could end up happening. It's possible to come here with a project 
and have it aligned very closely with a group and have the group say, that's great, let's do this and, and let's give you resources and work together on it. Mm -hmm. It's possible to come up, come in with a project and have it be, you know, ideologically aligned with a group. Um, you know, that's why we would put you in a group. Uh, but it's your project, and you might end up working on it for the thesis, and the group might end up working on it. The third, which in some ways I think might actually be the most likely, is that you come here with a project, and you may discover that there's other things you want to work on too. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that is one of the interesting things here. I, I mean, generally speaking, people don't get into programs like this one unless you are already doing some very, very interesting work. But a whole lot of people come here with very, very interesting work and then find a whole other set of things to get interested in. Um, so I don't think it should be a barrier unless you're sort of insistent that you want to be in group one, in which case you'd really want to be very certain that you were working with a group that, that was excited about picking up your project and running with it. And, and that's hard to guarantee. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, folks like yeah. Heather and me are, are pretty opinionated. Uh, mm -hmm. And we have the projects that we <laughs> want to work on and that we're excited about. And uh, yeah, we're swayable sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Um, Shannon, you were going to do an online question. Would you mind standing over here just so I don't have to repeat it? Sure. Um, this is uh, mostly bouncing off of Sarah, although I think other people might have some as well. The first question was, what if you're coming in and you're purely documentary? Is this the right program? And if, if so, why? And the other one was sort of the opposite end of that, is if, what if you want to work with Open Doc Lab? Do you have to have made a documentary in order to do so? Okay, I'll answer the second question first. No, <laughs> you don't at all. You just have to have an interest. And usually, though, you have some skills, something that's aligned um, with documentary making. Um, so that the first question, if you're a documentary purist, um, so I, I mean, I would have to um, find out what they mean by that. Yeah. Um, but for us, we're rethinking the documentary, and we, you know, support linear documentary. We think it's great, but it's not what we're working on and studying yeah. and and incubating yeah. at I mean, the doc lab. There are masters programs that are strictly in documentary filmmaking, and if you're certain that you really don't want to study the history of X, Y, or Z, or take a class called Major Media Text, or take a class called Theories and Methods 1 and 2, because you have certain documentaries that you want to, you know, then maybe uh, a documentary filmmaking program is a better match for you. Yeah. Um, so I, I w I'm not saying no to this person, don't apply. I'm just saying um, you need to be open and flexible and interested in all kinds of things that are happening around here, right. even if you happen to be more directed in, in a certain area. Yeah. Yeah. Back to you. Anyone out there? Did you want to come in and take a seat? You're in the door. There's a seat up here if you'd like. Yeah. I have technical questions. This is about the application. Uh, you mentioned the portfolio. Uh, if we have something that's not new to the portfolio or just Yeah, the question was if you have something for your portfolio you want to include online, like a link to a web page or something, and it's not in English, is it disqualified? No, it's not disqualified, but if we don't speak your language, we're not going to get much out of it. <laughs> so, you know, okay, bear that in mind. Yes. Yes. The GRE scores submitted last year are still in the system. Um, yeah. GREs are their scores are valid for five years. And I guess is part of the question if one has applied before. Yes. If you've already submitted your scores to MIT right. and they are still valid, I still have them, and you don't have to send them again. Nice. Very good. Thank you. Um, you and then. Um, I was just wondering, it seems that the research assistantship or TA uh, ship is pretty integral to getting the most out of the program. So I'm just wondering, are people, are there students who, for example, maintain a full-time job um, or are able to sort of juggle sort of maintaining institutional ties in other places while being part of this program? Is that just generally impossible or... If you are a cyborg, <laughs> it, as long as you have no sleep needs. <laughs> but really, people don't come in who are also working full-time jobs somewhere else. It's very, very intense kind of experience. Um, you know, theoretically, 20 hours a week in the lab, but it can bleed over. It can be more. Uh, sometimes at certain moments, um, you've got your classwork. Um, you've got a very, very full plate here. So. 
I, I think that for us, when we were thinking about it for first semester, our um, commitments with lab and coursework and everything came to usually, and reading and all that, in the first semester came to between like 50 and 70 hours a week. It was a lot. So doing, yeah, doing a full-time job on top of that, like, you'd have to, yeah. <laughs> but as far as but, other yeah. affiliations, um, we did have a student who graduated last year who was very involved with uh, running an annual film festival. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. And so that was something that he was able to do a few hours a week and then sort of stop and, and take a few days to sort of go work on that. And yeah. um, he needed a little extra time to graduate. He went over into the summer, um, but it was not impossible. Uh, but that was definitely not a full-time job. Uh, but that question of sort of if you have another affiliation, a volunteer project that's very important to you, something like that, that's feasible. Um, but another job while you do this is not. Yeah. So there's a, sorry, um, there's a section um, on the application for test scores, and there are a series of open uh, boxes to place information about your resume, about um, relevant <coughs> travel experience. What are those fields for? How much space is appropriate to use? I mean, I could write volumes about those things, but they're also present in other elements of the application. So what, what do you hope to see in those open form sections of the application? Shannon, is that something you can answer just because you've got yeah, the form sure. memorized better than I do? Yeah. I just kind of um, read the end product. But. If it's something that shows up in another part of the application, don't bother repeating it because the, the committee has already seen it. They really do read these applications very thoroughly. The open spaces are primarily for something that doesn't fall into the other boxes. So something extra, something or something that you want to really highlight that you did, something exceptional about you, that's pretty much what they're for. Does that... Help. Okay. okay, thanks. Um, is the research assistantship or the financial fee all equally applied to international students too? Yes. Yes, yeah. Uh, I have a question about mentorship. Um, you mentioned that the thesis you might be working on would be separate from your lab work. You also mentioned a thesis committee. I'm just wondering, like, when you're working on your thesis and you're looking for people to help advise you or guide you or just collaborate with, is that usually on the onus of the student to find those people, or does the program kind of help you seek the we, we do help you. Um, as director of graduate studies, I am meeting with students to gauge their progress. Um, hey, I need to meet with you guys and gauge your progress. <laughs> <laughs> do that. Um, uh, uh, but uh, so someone comes in to meet with me, and I say, hey, what's your thesis going to be on? And they say, oh, X, Y, or Z. And I say, well, who are you thinking of working with? And typically, people have a pretty good idea. Like, you know, like, Ethan would be perfect. How many students does he already have? You know, we work out the logistics. Is it viable? Have you talked to him yet? Have you gone to his office hours? Whatever. Um, but And then we want to get your committee together, which is typically just one second person. Um, uh, with a C CMS affiliation, right, Shannon? We don't. They so have, we, we ask for one person mm -hmm. to be one of our regular CMS um, cohort, but you can also have a Some, mentor from outside. Right. Sometimes the second person is outside, so you might have someone from history urban or urban studies who didn't have a direct affiliation, but you're the director of the of your project would be a primary. Yeah. And sometimes another yeah, university, but that's less common. Less encouraged, but yeah, it can happen. Yeah. And this is something that um, faculty here take very seriously. Yeah. And, yeah. It, you know, one of the things we've actually been working on is sort of ensuring that faculty um, have a manageable number of people that they're working with um, because it, it really is a commitment. I mean, I'm meeting with my thesis students weekly uh, yeah. when they're in the thesis year. Yeah. And, um, you know, working on writing week by week as it's going forward. So it, yeah. it is a very close relationship. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, also, uh, just to add to that, um, sometimes it can very much come out of your lab work. Uh, so I ended up coming in and having like strong kind of ideological ties, as you were mentioning, uh, with the game lab. So I'm actually working with Mikhail here on my thesis, and that kind of happened serendipitously through doing lab work. So um, you know, you, you could even have like strong ideas coming in, like oh, I want to work with so and so, and then you know that might shift around as you start kind of developing your ideas and. Your, your work outside and how that ends up influencing all parts of your life. Right, things evolve organically. Uh huh. Yeah. There was a question in the back. I, yes. yes. Hi, I'm Jesse. Uh, I was wondering when you think about your approach to your application, how important is it to take the mentality that you're applying to and identify your research interests 
and how they align with CMS as a program versus the research groups that you're specifically interested in. Okay, so Jesse asks about the, you know when you're applying and you're thinking about your application, do you want to be thinking about your alignment with CMS as a whole or versus a research group? Right. Um, I, I would say CMS as you're, you know, thinking about organically what we do as, as a whole. That said, in some cases, you know, if you are clearly, you know, documentary is very strongly your focus, the way you sort of pitch yourself might be strongly influenced by the fact that you've studied what Open Doc uh, Lab is and, you know, you know about it. Um, but given... Uh, I'm a little stuck here. Um, Given that as you take classes, your, your, your interests might shift a little bit. We want to bring in someone who's open to all the possibilities of CMS, all the different things that are going on, you know, to just pitch yourself as like, I'm a hyper studio person, I think would be too limiting. Um, so I think it's better to think about CMS kind of more holistically as a, as a kind of rule of thumb. Yeah. Sure. There's one more. Uh, one more out here. Um, is does the stipend cover summer funding? Um, and if not, is there opportunities to apply for summer Does grants? Does the stipend cover summer funding, and if not, are there opportunities? There are, Shannon, you can probably answer that a little better than I can as, yeah. a, as a practical kind of thing. Um, as a rule, no, the, the stipend does not cover, su cover summer funding. Some research groups have funding, and they will work if your thesis and research group are um, very closely aligned and they have funding, they can offer you a, a, a summer RA, but there are also uh, funds at the institute that you can apply for for summer research funding. Right, which is so that funding to say travel somewhere to do yes. your work as opposed to just a monthly <coughs> living stipend Correct. kind of application. Yeah. So in short, there are opportunities, but we don't have anything guaranteed for your summer. Yeah. Anyone else in the room? Because we can go to the internet. Shannon wants us to go to the internet. <laughs> yeah. I'm advocating You're so good to take care of them, Shannon. Thank um, you. The question is, will proposing a project that is bigger than the scope of the program be detrimental? Will proposing a project that is bigger than the scope of the program be detrimental? Sure. <laughs> you know, like, uh, well, okay, look, there are big questions. Like, I'm interested in how technological inter interventions can, you know, improve health care. Um, well, that's huge, right? And then something specific, like, how can uh, data sensors test air quality to see whether, you know, if people are, uh, people with, as with asthma are, you know, what they're getting into their system? You know, that's a very narrow question. So, um, Obviously, if your research question is too broad, then we'll, you know you don't you haven't thought about it enough. You don't have enough focus. You haven't d done a deep dive yet. Um, I don't know if there's anyone else who could answer that better or have like specific examples of students and how they narrowed their interests. Or I just agree. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Don't say I want to investigate how we can use games for learning. Like yeah, just, yeah, games for learning. Gonna, That's pretty broad. Oh, it's enough about it. Yeah. yeah, talk about your specific game that you've been developing or thinking about or the game that you've been playing that you're really invested in or, you know, keep it very specific uh, or give specific examples to show your interests. I do have one more question from the Internet that I know you guys are going to want the answer to. Hang on a sec. <laughs> Were you going to add something, Ethan? No, I was yeah. just going to say I, I think it, it might be sort of a one-two. It's helpful for me to know what your big interests are. It mm -hmm. helps me to know what your motivations are. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I'm looking for in master's students is the ability to frame an answerable question. Right. So giving me a question that isn't answerable, not just in a master's, but in a PhD or in a 20-year mm -hmm. career, is generally just, it's sort of a sign of poor judgment. Um, so part of what I'm looking for is your ability to sort of be realistic about your time. Uh, and everything else that you're being asked to do in this and to pick off the, the right chunk of work to, to work on um, at, this, at this moment in your academic career. Thank you. That's a very helpful reasoned response. That time goes really fast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, one more from the room, and then we have a practical sure. question from Shannon here. Yes. I have a question about the open documentary work. Um, what if you come from a more theoretical background and not in the making of documentary films, but I come from an art history background, mm -hmm. sort of about the theoretical side of documentary. Is that 
Right. An open doc lab question, what if you come from a more theoretical background rather than a practical maker kind of background? Well, I mean, we balance theory and practice in all of our in our education and in our labs in particular are sort of the practical side of the education. Um, so, but I think theory is good and to have the overall picture and, you know, a theoretical understanding of what you're doing and where it fits into, um, you know, sort of the bigger cultural understanding of documentaries. But, and, and the PI is a theorist, um, William Riccio, so there, there is theory. But the, it's very practical work. The 20 hours a week is, is very hands-on practical work. Actually, yeah, my practical experience is more in, in the media production, so I think Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's all kinds of research skills, writing skills, um, you, you know. You don't have to have made a documentary. No, not at all, no. You, you just have to have a good reason why you want to be in the lab and what you want to learn from it. Shannon? The, the question that I know you all want to know the answer to is, does the stipend cover health insurance? Does the stipend cover health insurance? And the answer is yes. Yes, good, thank you, that's very practical. Um, we are almost out of time, so I'm wondering if there's any last, uh, we can end on that practical note, but uh, if anyone has a real zinger to end with, we could also, now the pressure's on. Anybody? I can go again. Sure, sure. Um, I'm curious to know, you know, you had nine <coughs> How has the program itself changed since it started? And sort of how do you see it changing in the future? How has the program changed since it started? How do I see it changing in the future? That's a, that's a good, tough one. Um, I've only been here since 2012. So um, I don't think that I have the deep institutional history. It's, it's been a program that has evolved over time in interesting ways that um, only since we merged with uh, the the with writing, have we sort of had standalone institutional status? We were more closely aligned with literature in the past, so there have been really interesting changes um, over time. Uh, we are um, hopeful that we'll make a new hire in the future, so we're trying to you know keep growing and growing. Um, anyone else have a better question? I for can that? Yeah. answer. I've been answer here ten years. Oh yes. Um, <laughs> Uh, it has changed, and it really changes based on the faculty that come in and what their research areas, and then labs develop out of those research areas, and then also what they teach and how they mm -hmm. teach the courses. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's overall comparative media studies <coughs> looking at it across borders and institutions and platforms, um, time periods. But then within that, it's hugely mm -hmm. um, dependent on the people that are here. Yeah. yeah, so if we make another hire and it's someone in, you know, with a comics focus, that's a whole, you know, big area that we haven't had a really uh, <coughs> hardcore kind of specialist in. Yeah. Or, you know, we might go into a different <coughs> area. And, you know, so, so it, as the program grows and we make new hires and so on, um, makes a difference. Were you going to add something? Yeah, and on a smaller scale, I mean, each group of students that comes in, everyone's got, yeah, these kinds of different backgrounds and interests. And so each class kind of, like almost forms its own kind of identity, and that ripples through um, you know later generations of students. Uh, I mean, we still feel uh, a couple of years ago, definitely last year, and you know, I, I guess we've been rubbing off in some ways on, on the next the next cruise. So um, yeah, it's kind of big. And, yeah, and it, and it might if you, if you can all come to the um, colloquium at five o'clock with the alumni panel. That's a range of people from the class of I think two thousand ten. <coughs> Up to oh, yeah. like last year, so you get a little more bit of a what? Oh yeah, Mark. Two thousand two. Nice. All right. So yeah. you get a nice kind of range, a kind of nice picture of uh, alums past and present, and you know, give you a sense of what might happen in the future. This 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 panel is today at five o'clock. There are maps in the hallway on that table. Also, fabulous keychains with little lights on them. <laughs> CMSW keychains. Uh, uh, in media, yeah. <laughs> I don't. Yeah, you could open a lock with it. That's kind of it. Um, but the uh, it's in. Uh, is it building two, room two three one? Building four, room two three one. Correct. Thank you, building four, room two three one, um, which you can find on the map or you can plug it into your phone. And uh, MIT is a bit of a labyrinth, right, with the numbers and the hyphens and everything. But, but if you can't find your way to the building, you probably shouldn't be coming here anyway. So. Yeah, you need 
strong spatial skills to, uh, to survive. Yeah. I know tenured faculty who can't find No, I, 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 yeah. I, I, I joke uh, because I have the same problem. Yeah, we all have There's a building 14E and a building E14, and... The, yeah, you know, the, the gaps are endless, are endless. But anyway, <laughs> I do hope to see many of you there. Um, and thank you so much for coming today. I hope we answered a lot of your questions. Thanks. Thank you.